I hope you still feel that way when we get through. <laughs> I suppose there has been no word more often defined than love. And there is also, perhaps, no word about which there is as much misunderstanding and conflict of opinion as in this simple four letter word. I think we can start perhaps by a study of affection as it is found in Neoplatonism, which I think was a wonderful combination of philosophy and mysticism. It flourished in both Athens and Alexandria in the opening years of the Christian era, and certainly considerably affected uh, early Christian mysticism. According to the Neoplatonists, love exists on a whole series of levels. It is not just a simple, single emotion. It consists of a series of aspects or interpretations which relate to the various specialties of human consciousness. In other words, love can be applied to a wide variety of phenomena in life. According to the Neoplatonists, the highest form of love, so far as humanity is concerned, is love of God. And the highest conceivable form of love is God's love for man. And this God's love is represented especially in the great sacrifice in which God gives his son for the salvation of man. Therefore, whether it be in Christian or neo-Christian philosophy, love is a divine quality by substance in its own highest and most essential nature. It is therefore a certain solicitude, a deep and abide, abiding emotional attachment by which the individual expresses devotion through conduct, through the service of the beloved. This was the foundation of both Platonic and Neoplatonic definition of love. And it passes through a whole series of modifications. Next to the love of God, where do we turn? The Neoplatonists said, the next love in importance is the love of truth. Truth becomes the most precious thing available to the human being on his own level of existence. Truth must be regarded as the thing or power that heals all wounds, that reveals to man fully and clearly the affection of God for him. Truth, therefore, represents a series of realities in existence which were placed there for the salvation of living things. To know the truth is to free oneself of the errors of ignorance. But again, truth is a very difficult word to define. That which is truth for one person may not be truth for another. And the underlying eternal and inevitable truth is still beyond the common acceptances of human beings. To each person, truth is his way of looking at reality. And as this is true of countless persons, we do have a kind of definition for truth, namely that it is reality as seen through the sensory perceptions of the human being. And because human beings are different, not only in degrees of inward perceptions, but in their devotions and dedications to those values which they believe, then we find a great chain of secondary circumstances and definitions which are important in the study of man's affections and the proper bestowal of them 
upon the realities and significant values of living. Among the Neoplatonists, perhaps the next uh, level of uh, truth or love was wisdom. And wisdom is primarily love of truth. And because truth itself is so extremely abstract and difficult to capture even by the mind, wisdom is therefore respected, honored, and regarded with affection because it opens the way to the achievement of truth. Therefore, we should love wisdom. We should love all of the forms of knowledge by which we are inspired to search for ultimate truth. The search must continue, but we must also be grateful for the abilities we have to achieve the ends we seek. Therefore, gratitude is a form of love. Gratitude is the individual accepting graciously the good things that happen to him or the good deeds that are done on his behalf. And next, perhaps, in all of the uh, Neoplatonic thinking, we have love as a be love of beauty. The beautiful surrounds us in life. And if we are properly integrated people, we, be we find in beauty an object for affection. We love the beautiful. And while this love is an impersonal kind of love, we now come also to the realization that love can be impersonal. That love does not necessarily have to have a personal object. Love can be devoted or dedicated to values which are not visible, may not even be definable by the average person but still have a real effect upon us. And one of the most important of these is the love of beauty. And this has been with us since the dawn of time. Even in our most primitive uh, culture groups, there were efforts to express beauty. Now, the beauty expressed was sometimes uh, a faint shadow of the artistry that we think about today. Man's primitive knowledge of beauty was very scanty. Yet to himself, it meant something. It was an achievement. It was like a small child trying to draw a picture. The picture is meaningful to that child and represents the highest degree of its capacity at the moment, but may not have any influence or interest for other people. So love of beauty brings with it also love of all the arts as expressions and as testimonies and as inspirations up to conduct. We have music and painting and sculpturing. We have the dance and the theater. We have all kinds of manifestations of beauty on the level of aesthetics. Now, beauty on the level of aesthetics is something that comes against another problem in human nature, namely that the average individual does not have a clear enough concept of value within himself to be able to support with his own additional concern the various arts which are possible to him. The arts of the of Asia come in here as a very interesting sideline of thought. The Chinese painters were tremendously ensouled or deeply inspired by a strange kind of love. And that was the love for the manifestation of the divine in all the creations which come through man himself. Natural love comes from the adoration of nature. Human love, very largely through man's appreciation of nature, as this is captured in painting and in etchings and in all the different forms by which we attempt to perpetuate our own evaluation of the beautiful around us. 
Another level of love, of course, is love of virtue. The virtuous life, the effort of the individual, individual to live upon the highest level of his attainments constitutes a level of appreciation relating to love. Love, therefore, must love the good, must serve the beautiful, and must recognize the eternity of the one. These things together constitute a triad of attributes by which it is possible to more or less arrive at a working definition of infinite affection. Now, as we go down the line still further, we come to various forms which we distinguish in ourselves. And among these are human relationships. Therefore, love to the average person is a human emotion. It is an emotion based upon affection for persons. This type was called the love of family, love of humanity. The Greeks were well aware of this form. And so were the Chinese, who made a very strong philosophical case for family love. They called it more or less fidelity. It was the fact that in the home there was not only mutual affection, but a mutual regard. And that affection was based upon the superior conduct of those loved. Love was not merely a relationship due to family birth. A child did not love a parent because merely it was a parent. The child loved the parent because the parent was good, was kind, was understanding, and was in turn lovable. Therefore, personal love is based upon qualities which to each person appear to be lovable. Some find it in one way and some in another. But in the family life, love is essential to the survival of the home and is the basis of all human relationships in this world. We love that which is worthy of love, worthy of affection. And unless we demand some level of worthiness, our affections become promiscuous and lose the value of moral support. So family love is love of parent for child, husband for wife and vice versa, and parents for children and children for parents. And, of course, to a certain measure, this extends to the friend or the visitor within the family environment. All of this depends entirely for its integrity upon the fact that those loved are lovable. It is a very difficult and usually fruitless effort to love that which is not lovable. This doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but we should not expect the impossible. Unless we can really say that we find communion, unless there is some reasonable reason for our affection, we are not capable of definite love. If this is lacking, then we may depend upon respect or regard of a lesser nature, or even depend upon duty as remaining where personal feelings may have been hopelessly weakened. Therefore, some families are held together by duty alone. Some are held together by economic necessities. Some are held together by domination of one person over others. But unless beauty is present in its natural freedom, its natural sharing of all that is good, the home life is insecure. And if the home life is insecure, future generations are endangered. So love of family is very much involved in our relationships. Then, of course, the Greeks, like almost all other people, love said love of country, patriotism, or devotion to the system which we believe to be acceptable in government. In all times, from now and then past, as far back as we can, as we can go, love of government has been sketchy. Very few people are entirely satisfied with their governments. Most people believe that 
their governments are misrepresenting them, or that government is a burden upon the human being, and that it is a source of exploitation and of various corruptions. I think in this particular case, however, we have to face the simple reality that corruption does not live long unless it is supported. And most persons are not sufficiently firm in their affection for anything, except perhaps their bank books, to have a proper attitude towards their responsibilities. Love has responsibilities as well as opportunities. That which we love, we must help to maintain its, in all, its own integrities. And if these integrities are slipping away, we must do everything possible to restore them. Also, we have various other f forms of affection. We have love of friends. And friendship is a very firm affection, as told in the ancient story of Damon and Pythias. Friendship is sometimes uh, the most powerful form of affection because in many instances relatives are not sincere, but a friend we assume to be sincere. And friendship becomes an emotion of sincerity. This, of course, is very often corrupted by ulterior motive. We cultivate people for what we hope they get from them, not for what we hope to give them. And the corruption or dilution of affection is always a sad tragedy. But it is true very definitely that sometimes, in fact, more than sometimes, friendship is the strongest bond that we have in this world, much stronger than brotherhood. Because brotherhood very often represents relatives in a family who are not true to each other or have no common ground in integrities. So we go down through all these different levels there are more than we can possibly list. Love of animals. This is quite important because in many instances uh, these other creatures contribute very much to our own integrities. They provide us solace in times of emergency. They provide us means of advancing, uh, for maintaining our palms and in institutions. And they are very much present as an educational force in the life of children. So there is love of animals and the dedication not to injure uh, without cause any living thing. Now, this does not mean that we can always preserve them, but it means that we should have a natural affection and that our first regard of them should be that of friendship. Friendship with other kingdoms is quite a possibility. I remember very definitely a beautiful experience in the Kasuga Parks in, in Nara in Japan. In this temple, which is a Shinto sanctuary, uh, there are vast parks, and in these parks, the temple deers wander about in a condition of complete friendliness. They will come up alongside of you and walk with you. Uh, they will look up at you with those soulful eyes that nothing can resist, and uh, also hope with this touch of humanity that we're going to feed them something. Uh, I remember that... Uh, I had some uh, feed for them in my hand, and one of them came up behind me, put his head under my arm, under my jacket, and put his head up and looked at me. <laughs> it was irresistible. Not only that, but in the, in the spirit of the thing, as soon as I gave him the little morsels, he bowed to me. <laughs> he bowed appreciation. He had been well tutored in knowing when there was a likelihood of more food. <laughs> but the animal is always a, a wonderful experience. Therefore, love of animals comes very often from having pets when you were children and growing up with a certain regard for life, a regard which is part of love and a very serious part of love. At the Sarasawa Pond, also in Nara, there is a little lake, a little, I guess it's an artificial one, but it's large enough to contain quite a few fish and so on. 
there is a ritual performed there quite frequently. Uh, children will go to a little store in the town and they'll buy a goldfish in a little glass bowl about the size of a drinking glass. Then the children, the family, and the priest, probably, will all go to down to the shore of the lake and will go through the ritual of releasing the goldfish. The child has saved his spending money to buy a goldfish for the purpose of releasing it. Now, this is quite contrary to our thinking. We probably put it in a bowl and let it stand around a while until it went out of existence by natural causes. But to these people, the release of the living thing was much more important than keeping it in your own house. Make it not a prisoner, but liberate it. And the process of liberating birds and animals throughout Asia has been quite common in many parts of, the, of, the, of those continents. At the time of the special celebration in honor of President Grant, back in the middle of the last century, the celebration included the release of birds so that they could carry the glad tidings. And every type of living thing that is lovable should be loved. And if we cannot love them closely because of their natures, we can at least recognize a kinship with all that lives. And this is very important. Ernest Thompson Seton told me once an interesting story. Uh, while he was, he was a great naturalist, as you know. And uh, one time when he was out uh, drawing and sketching, he saw a deer coming toward him. And the deer was running away from a hunter with a gun. And the deer was uncertain where to go, what to do. He evidently sensed danger. And then what he did was to run over to Seton and stand there beside him. The deer took refuge with the human being. And another human being was out to shoot the deer. This is life. But these types of things should be remembered always <clears throat> in judging our relationships with life in all of its aspects and attributes. We do not destroy for sport. We do not destroy for skill. And we try to preserve life as much as we can. And when it comes close to us, we try to serve it to the best of our ability. This is a distinct and solid form of love. It is far more valuable in the development of the human being than all the protestations of affection that are possible. Then there comes two forms of, of love which are particularly exemplified in Oriental philosophy. They are covered very largely in the New Testament also, but in slightly different words. In uh, Buddhism, the northern school, there are two deities, the Bodhisattva Kannan, or Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy, and the world savior to come, the Buddha or Bodhisattva Maitreya. Now these words are very interesting because they're names of something. And uh, Kannan is compassion. This deity is the embodiment of man's compassion for all that lives. Any enmities, any antagonisms, any old family feuds that interfere with the natural growth of the individual have a penalty which very few of us really want to pay. Therefore, we have to prevent that penalty from arising. The goddess of mercy, so-called, in the Far East, represents the infinite kindliness for all living things. These, uh, these deities, Kanan, for instance, was not truly a god, nor a goddess. Kanan, according to Buddhism, was once a mendicant, maybe millions of years ago on another star, who dedicated his existence to the service of, of humanity and gradually grew up and took an obligation an obligation which continues in northern Buddhism to this day that he, that he will not or she will not 
because both forms exist. A seek final emancipation from life will not seek infinite release into eternity, into the great nirvana, until this being can take with it every other living creature. Now, this is a very beautiful thought, even though we may not be able, able always to grasp it, that there can be no uh, release for those who love truth, God, or their fellow man until they can carry with them into peace those around them. And this service is not the individual looking for release for himself, but sacrificing his own hope of peace to give peace to someone else. Now, when we get into this level of thinking, we really begin to understand love. For love is always the forgetting of self. It is not because we lose all the attractiveness of it, which we will have to come to in a few minutes, but because of the infinite magnitude of the situation. The Buddha to come, according to uh, Northern Buddhism, and that includes the Tibetan, Japanese, Korean, and Bhutan groups, is called Maitreya, or Miraku. The word means kindness. That is the meaning of the word. It's not a name, really. It is a word. And it's the, the definition of it is that Maraku is the hope of all nations, the hope of all that lives. And at the end of all strife, the second coming of the Messiah, for Miraku was the desire of Messiah to come in Buddhism, the second coming of Christ is kindness in the human heart. You'd do a hard time to get a better philosophy than that. It would be very difficult to find a more ennobling concept. And yet there's something about it that is so essentially true. And uh, in Northern Buddhism especially, the realizations of these facts have never disturbed the individual. They have never made them sorrowful or feel that they are frustrated or that they are inhibited or that they cannot do what they want to do. Because according to their thinking, when love comes, it do, you do what love wants you to do. You, you find your own complete happiness and fulfillment in the service of values higher than yourself and or more needy than your own. Until these realizations strike us, we have very little understanding of the responsibility of true love. Now, in other nations also, we find, uh, especially in the words of Christ, uh, insistence upon love. We often think of Christ as a spirit of love, and this probably is the essential meaning embodied in a great cosmological phenomenon. But the actual thing, as Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And among the words of Jesus, we remember the ones that goes to this way. Uh, those who do not love their brother who they have seen, how can they love their God whom they have not seen? The idea that the individual can have a religious life without expressing creative and constructive affection is just wrong. Because there can be no religion apart from the practice of the virtues attributed to the sacred books as necessary. Paul says, and the greatest of these are faith, hope, and charity, now translated love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, the idea of placing affection as the standard of conduct will probably come as a much of a surprise to people. But in the great pattern of things, we all exist because of a love beyond our comprehension. We all live because of a beautiful world that was given to us. Wonderful opportunities. We bring other children into the world 
with the opportunity to love them, to help them to grow and to improve and to fulfill their destinies. Children are not ours to control or demand. They are ours to protect and serve and bring up to the point where they can be released constructively into society. We must do almost the same thing with the children that we do when we release the birds in the Japanese ceremony. We release all life to the fulfillment of itself, but we do all that we possibly can to make that life as rich and noble as it can be before it goes out on its own journey. All these things are values that are not difficult. They are not sad, horrible things. They are not the cause of atomic bombs and all this type of thing. The thing that is causing our trouble is that in some strange way we have mistaken the meaning of the word love. Perhaps one of the problems that we have is that self-interest takes dominance over practically every other emotion in the lives of modern people. Each individual is protecting himself against those who in one way or another have despitefully used him. He is therefore inclined to try to return evil for evil. If someone is unkind, he feels justified in being unkind also. And on this policy, unkindness goes on forever. For there is never a time when we will not have some aspect of it, unless, as individuals, we take a new viewpoint of our own lives. How can we, as individuals, therefore, and find out a better use of our own emotions. How can we recognize the true meaning of affection? Now we descend into what might be termed the secular level of, of uh, emotions. We no longer think just in terms of the divine plan. We think in terms of daily relationships, human love, personal love, this level is, according to both the Chinese and the early Christians, a perfectly noble level. Uh, love, in its truest sense, is always right. It is always virtuous. It is always ensouling and inspiring. Therefore, that the individual who wishes to find God should give up human affections is wrong because God is in those human affections and he must perfect his understanding there before he can go further. Therefore, love in the family, love in the home, personal affections for each other are very noble as long as we do not pervert them, as long as we do not misuse these emotions or compromise them or defile them in one way or another. The uh, actual answer to most domestic problems is, therefore, a clean love. And until we get that, uh, the uh, human relationships will remain embittered and obscured. Now, love in family and home is something which makes things happy. Most of the peoples of other countries who have their own little philosophies of love are laughing people. We are the only ones, apparently, who find love a burden or the basis of something which uh, is too difficult for us to handle. Well, perhaps it's due to the complications of our way of life. We have become so bound up in transitory and impermanent values that we have lost the sense of directness. We are now constantly frustrated, worried, frightened, and uh, seeking in affection, not an expression of service, but an escape from some physical restriction upon our own conduct. Therefore, it is uh, true that we have to work out the problem of human relationships on the level of an integrity. For people in all walks of life, uh, the foundation of love is law. In other words, the law as it is, the law of love, is the only basis upon which problems of human existence can be arbitrated. 
There is no way in which we can ever solve the human problem without love. There is no way also that we can love as long as we are selfish. As long as our own ulterior motives dominate our human relationships, as long as our love centers upon the gratification of our own desires at the expense of others, and if every time in which love loses its, li its liberty, loses its freedom, uh, is a misfortune. But love free will never break a rule. Love free will never do that which is unrealistic or impure. Because love itself is the very essence of God's affection for mankind. Therefore, anything that is a corruption is no longer love. Every, anything that is dominated by ulterior motive is no longer pure affection. As long as self-interest, selfishness, gratifications of appetites dominate affection, we will never have any real love. And as a result of the lack of this love, homes are breaking up every minute and young people are almost afraid to establish them. Then we look out into the great pattern of the world, nations out to destroy each other. For why? For what reason? For what justifiable cause? None. The hatreds which we have nursed for generations simply corrupt and corrode our own lives. Family feuds go on for generations. And everyone is seeking to solve a problem, seeks to find self-gratification uh, or self-freedom uh, from responsibility. We believe that everything that goes wrong should be blamed on someone else. I know when I was quite young, uh, we had a kind of a family of feuders. Uh, our background had three generations of people who weren't speaking to each other. <laughs> well, every one of them had good old Scotch reasons, but they weren't really very good. But after a while, my illustrious grandmother, whom some of you have become acquainted with, uh, decided that I needed a little religious training. So, being a Scotch lady, she chose the Presbyterian Church, and I went to Sunday school there. And that was my first direct contact uh, with the uh, Bible. We had read readings, but the first time we'd really gone into a uh, serious thought about it. And uh, in the course of the readings, I found out so many wonderful things that seemed so good, such as f to uh, forgive your adversary immediately and do good to those that despitefully use you. Well, that sounded to me like I was already a, m a missionary. So I took the glad tidings home, and I was thoroughly punished. <laughs> I was told that it was none of my business and that anyone who should say that you should love those that despitefully use you should have your head examined. <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. It is, it is known that these truths are there. But the moment these truths come in contact with a personal antagonism, so much the worse for the truths. They don't have a chance. And that is happening all the time in our modern society. Talking with young people, they tell me that they have no real intention of establishing permanent relationships. They're just going to enjoy life the best they can as they go along. And if it doesn't work out, that's just too bad. Well, the, the, this type of thinking is bound to ultimately destroy most of our cultural life. The compromise of our integrities is never worse than when it compromises those divine attributes which have been placed in the human being. And one of them is the love of God living in us. And where we treat this badly or misuse it or pervert it, we have committed truly a sin against the Holy Spirit. And this is not something that we can do with impunity. It gradually results in increasing difficulties and tragedies, and life becomes more and more unlivable of which we don't really want to have happen. Now, we also find another uh, interesting area of affection, and that is, in a sense, love of knowledge. 
We all want to be well educated. We want to go to school. We want to develop some skill in life. Now, a skill in life is a very good thing to develop. Unfortunately, our modern educational system does not do an outstanding job of this. It has uh, more or less compromised things down to the economic level. We work because we hope to make money. And if we do not make money, we soon find out that we are not welcome in this society. But education and knowledge are important because we have too many people of good intention who really are lovable people, but they have no experience in anything. They are unable to handle their own affairs. They are unable to help other people. They simply do not have the practical insights that make usefulness significant in society. Therefore, in connection with knowledge, it seems that we who love God should also take special pains in how we learn the lessons of life. We can always learn some of them in the University of Hard Knocks, but that isn't quite sufficient. Everyone should dedicate a skill to the service of humanity. If we love people, and if we love God, and if we love truth, we have to develop a, a practical way of service. Love without some type of commitment to usefulness is merely a travesty, an excuse, an evasion, or a simple example of ignorance. To find a way of helping is our way of loving people. And to love them and to help them, we must be helpful people. And this means that a part of our lives should be devoted uh, to the other interpretation of love, charitas, or charity. Charity being the service of others, the doing of good deeds to those who need them. Now, in this time in our cultural existence, we are not much devoted to this because it's of the economic involvements. And uh, the, the whole problem of trying to be a servant in the house of the Lord gets to be pretty difficult. We cannot always do all kinds of big things, but if we have some background of a skill of some kind, we can help somebody sometime. If we learn how to run a family, if we know how to clean a house, if we know the principles of proper food, if we know anything that makes us helpful, we can help. So every life should have in it a dedication to being helpful, to find some way of expressing our concern for the common good, and should come forward whatever necessary to support ideas and principles which seem to be better than those we are living by today. Therefore, part of our affection for our neighbor and our world is that we shall inspire the improvement of the various systems which are necessary to the maintenance of civilization. All these things come very much into focus. Now also we have another problem that is rather a sticky wicket, and that is how much should we love ourselves? I don't think most people underestimate this too much. They do fairly well in most cases. But uh, we have to think this through a little bit more. Sometimes we, we, we ridicule the idea of anyone thinking about themselves or loving themselves. But actually, if we get onto the proper level, it's just part of the same picture. There's no reason why we should love other people and leave ourselves out. Because actually, the same power of good that we hope to share with another, we must hope to share with ourselves. So each individual has the duty and responsibility to make him or herself lovable. If, however, the individual includes himself with humanity, he then has certain rights also. He has certain privileges and certain obligations which he must meet in order to get along with himself constructively. 
each person examining his own nature and his own temperament should come to the conclusion that he is worthwhile, or if he isn't, that it's time to become that way. If the person should be able to look into his own life and be satisfied that he has done a reasonable job with it. He should not run away. He should not corrupt his body through all kinds of uh, dissipations. He should not have attitudes that are obviously unreasonable. He should not cater entirely to the selfishness of gain, exploitation, or profit. Nor should he put his own happiness above all other happiness. These things are mistakes, but the proper attitude is that we should be happy along with others who are happy, that we should more or less make happiness a stronger rule in our con conduct of affairs. We all have a right uh, to be considered s significant to some degree, and the better we become, the more thoughtful, wise, intelligent, and kindly we are, the more we have a right to feel that we are of some interest and value to the world in which we live. Therefore, it is not a mistake for the individual to have certain affection for his own inner life, but he should have affection for that part of himself, uh, which Emerson calls the oversoul. He should, he should have reverence and regard for the eternal dwelling in him. And he should be a true and faithful servant of the will of his own soul. And when this happens, then he is qualified to take a serious interest and have a deep respect for his own nature. Because actually, his own nature in a sense is an illusion. Well, the fact that the individual is a living creature by himself is, a, is a more or less of an illusion. We are alive because life is. We are alive because we are in a universe which is filled with life, and that is one life, one tremendous energy, and that life is truly the life of God. Therefore, the God in us must become part of our daily experience. We must live always as though the special guest of heaven was going to be at our table. We must never do things which heaven would not want to see, because as surely as we live, the heaven in us does see. We should try desperately to please that which is better, to please that which we know to be our true selves. For to the degree that we do this, our own lives are enriched, and we become more useful in the advancement of society. Therefore, in education, we should have the skills that are given by sciences, arts, philosophies, religions, but we should ensoul these forms of knowledge with the inner consciousness and light of our own lives. Therefore, if we want to become scientists, we can dedicate science to the great scientist in ourselves. Because finally, the great power of life has one of its attributes as science. Another is philosophy, another is art, as another in some other branch of learning. But all forms of learning in the last analysis are simply aspects of the one divine power. And that divine power flows through everything with skill dedicated to love. Every art and science is an expression of divine love. And if man perverts this, as in the development of nuclear weapons, for example, he is perverting a power and is transforming a love that is there into a fear or a hate or a scheme which he is trying to advance for his own purposes. It is therefore very, very necessary that the individual and soul the things that he is doing. In the shopkeeper, the parent, the teacher, any art, science, craft that we belong to should be ensouled. And when it is ensouled by a natural love and concern, we will have good lives. Now some will say it's a big price to pay to have to do all these things because actually very often 
because of our own ignorance and willfulness, the things we ought to do seem terrible. The things we want to do seem best. But this is only in of a seeming. We have to consider another dimension also that nearly all nations and peoples and philosophies and religions have considered. And that is the brevity of human life. The idea that we are going to be able to build a good life in the span of our years and to do as we please most of the time and give little or no thought to the major values of living. But that finally we will settle down to playing cribbage in our old age or something of that nature until we drift out of here. This type of thinking is contrary to everything that is necessary and useful for us. If love was something that died with the grave, if there was no more of it, if it had no existence except in some conscious decision of ourselves in the presence of adversities, probably there wouldn't be any particular value in it, except it would be a much more pleasant world to live in while we are here. But if, this is, if there, we are right that man is part of an eternal life motion, if we do not cease at the grave, if there is something that goes on, something that is ultimately judged or measured, something that we have to live up to or get over, if there are such values as this that endure beyond the grave, then love becomes the most important thing in the whole world because it is the only emotion that we can take into the presence of divinity. It is like, for instance, if our love is pure and true, our love as we go on into the universe is really the divine love going home in us, fulfilling its eternal purpose, and we become the good and faithful servants. So somewhere in this world there is a standard of excellence, a standard that has been violated from the beginning. A standard, however, which a few noble be beings have maintained in public for teaching, and many quiet, simple citizens have lived by throughout their years. There is much more love in the world working than we realize. But we don't hear much about that. Love isn't news. Scandal is news. The mistakes we make become famous. Our virtues apparently are ignored. But actually, whether they are or not is not important. Actually, the important thing is what we are doing to ourselves constantly. It is not important whether what we do is recognized. It, the important thing is, the, is to know that the best in ourselves is being attained, that we are truly going on to something that is worthwhile and uh, necessary for the advancement of the common good. Now, we all need a few props occasionally to kind of make life a little more in interesting and uh, meaningful to us. And in the world around us, for thousands of years, men have built great churches. They have built cathedrals and synagogues and mosques and temples. They have done all kinds of things to honor the invisible power of good. And they have established the concept that these sacred places are the houses of good, and they are also the houses of love. In these sanctuaries it is assumed that man can come in peace and quiet and communion with a, an eternal spirit that has the power to bestow upon him the peace of God. In the early church, the bishops exchanged the peace of God. It was a representation of the inner fraternity of living things, the realities which we share and by which we become truly one family, one life in truth. Now, all these buildings have influenced people. They are visual representations of dedications of some kind. Many of these buildings were centuries in the building. Some of them probably were built without any great amount of enlightenment in the motives. Maybe they were simply built for selfish purposes or for uh, to be a source of being remembered. But regardless of what they were in the beginning, 
we have come now to look upon them as great enduring symbols of the supremacy of the divine over the human. We therefore build these structures as beautifully as we can. Chartres, Rouen, the Sacre Coeur in Paris, Notre Dame, all of these great cathedrals are magnificent structures. The light shines through the beautiful stained glass windows. Peace and quiet is seemingly there. A few shadowy figures kneel in prayer. It is a very great quietude. And in those cathedrals, some way, it seems as though spiritual things get closer to us. They do not really, because it's actually our own inner life opening up just a little bit. A door in our own consciousness opens a small way, and then closes again when we go back in the secular world. But in these places there is a peace that has come from dedication and consecration. When a church is built, in most religions there is a ceremony of consecration. The building is set aside for the worship of God. If for any reason later its religious significance is fails or it is no longer needed for religious purposes, it has to have its consecration lifted before it can be used for secular purposes. It must be deconsecrated. Because a building set aside for sacred purposes cannot be just simply turned into a grocery store or something of that nature. And yet we take a world such as we have here, which is a consecrated world, and we change it into a place of merchandise. We do not even bother to deconsecrate it, because we do not realize that it was ever sacred. But all these thoughts come gradually into the mind of the individual who is concerned with life and wants to do a little better job of it. And in these wonderful buildings, you have actually a sense of something superior. I know that some of these churches, the uh, great cathedral of Cologne, was in the process of building for over 800 years, generation after generation. All kinds of strange things happened to it. At one time it was used as a stable, another time as a granary, and once as a, a storehouse for gunpowder. But gradually these things faded away, and now it is what it was intended to be, a magnificent sacred edifice. Now this, all churches, all temples, and all shrines are in some mysterious way uh, symbols of ourselves. The human being is the living temple of the eternal God. And each of us as a person is a servant in the house of that temple. We must worship at the altar of the divinity in ourselves. Not the mistakes we make, but the tremendous principles and integrities. We were born consecrated. We were consecrated in space before we ever got here. We were dedicated to the service of truth, love, beauty, and God. When we get here, it sort of fades away. Some retain it. Some find it as a result of the journey of life. Some come to it in tragedies of the moment. But actually, the real answer to it is that this consecration is the basis of happiness. Love and happiness are very closely related. And through love we earn happiness. And as the Arabian Nights Entertainment says, happiness must be earned. It is not something that we are entitled to because we are here. We are entitled to happiness only because we deserve it. And the only way we can deserve happiness is by doing those things which cause it and bring it about and sustain it. And the things that do that, the things that bring happiness to the world, are expressions of love, affection, friendship, regard, unselfishness, service, and solicitude for the sorrows of life. If, therefore, we really want to have a good life, we must, in one way or another, learn that happiness is a product of achievement of that which is good. 
almost all of the happiness things that we enjoy today are very temporary in their fulfillments. We want something. It's going to make us happy. We get it. There's that great moment of happiness, and pretty soon we're bored to death. We have to get new things. The, uh, the beautiful new car that made us so happy we could hardly stand it the day we got it is now generally referred to as the old wreck. It's gone. We have to do something else. The, the values that we create simply to satisfy appetites of any kind, these values are in permanent. They don't last. They have no reality and substance in them. They are comforts or things of this nature, fulfillments of personal ambitions or personal selfishness, but have no substance. Real happiness has to be useful. It has to come from a life well lived, not from a life devoted entirely to the desperate habit and habit of trying to escape responsibility. So in every way we go along the way, uh, we find that something that is uh, deeper has to come into uh, our experience. In our little squabbles in life, there has to be an element of love somewhere to bring peace. And sometimes uh, peace is quietude. Uh, our Zen brethren are greatly interested in peace, not because it makes them comfortable, but because peace is God's way. If to be in peace is to be in the universe as it really is. So the old Chinese painter makes the beautiful mountains and rivers and bridges, and down in the corner he puts a little man sitting under a tree and looking at it all. This is, to a measure, not simply walking out on civilization. It is a symbol of the individual quietly restoring himself because he is in an atmosphere that is real. We are all suffering from false atmospheres and false uh, dedications, and uh, therefore the monk goes out in the Zen tradition and sits under a tree somewhere and just sees things as they are. He also becomes aware of the comparative unimportance of himself. He sees that he is only a part of something so much bigger that he is hardly a gnat in the sunbeam. He is sitting quietly watching the universe move around him, and he is part of that universe. He comes and goes with the seasons. He sees beauty. He can protect it to some degree. He becomes infinitely aware of little things, and these are so often the basis of well-being. A happiness does not always come from a great achievements, but from little things. And most of the little things that bring happiness come to it, come to us as love, as affection, as a kind of inner understanding, a wonderful sympathy with life. So to the uh, little monk sitting under the uh, tree in the Chinese painting, the sympathy with life is all important. The individual feels himself as part of something. And in feeling it, he feels more than this kinship. He feels something a little more important than that. He feels that this kinship uh, carries with it the rules of conduct. That this sympathy and, sin and uh, kinship is a way of life in itself. A way of life that it shares in the mystery of life everlasting, that it shares in the way of solution, that it is our only hope of individual security or world peace. Somewhere along the line, kindness must come into birth. And there's never been an absence of it. The seed of kindness is in the hearts and souls of everything that lives. It is part of our life. It is part of all the good that exists in the world. But we have to call it forth by some kind of magic, and that magic is love. Nothing else will bring it out of the deep caves where it has hidden itself against the sorrows, pressures, and glooms of the day. Now, in our particular moment where we're living now, 
we are probably under greater stress than most people have ever experienced in this life and perhaps have never experienced in previous lives. This is an extremely critical period. It is a period in which there must be an awakening. This awakening has to come. Otherwise, there will be no solution uh, to the fact that man can become ever more dangerous to himself. The solution has to be, as the Buddha says, in the coming of the Maitreya Buddha, the coming of the spirit of kindness, the spirit of being gentle, the spirit of protecting life, of finding ways to arbitrate difficulties, and also to practice the great virtues of unselfishness and modesty and humility that are part of our divine inheritance. Actually, the human being, because the human being is by nature divine, is an extremely simple creature. We like to think of the human being as terribly complicated. But, and we think of God as terribly complicated. But to the mystic, both God and man are very simple creatures. A deity has the simplicity of absolute perfection. The simplicity of living forever in love and truth. We don't have to think of God going to school. We don't have to think of all the different things we have to do to try to learn to be decent citizens as necessary to the archangels. We assume that these beings in the simple goodness of things, as Aquinas has pointed out, that actual goodness, true goodness, is an open door to the infinity of knowing. There is nothing that can be concealed from the good and nothing that can be revealed through the evil. Therefore, by the simple process of being good, simple people, we accomplish the destiny of the God within us. It is a simple relationship between that which is eternally quiet and the quietude that we seek every day. It is not a power like deity thundering out in the silences and pointing his finger accusingly at us. We have pointed our fingers accusingly at each other and occasionally have pointed them in his direction. But actually, deity never works except through love. Every correction that we get is given beautifully if we'll accept it. Everything that we have to change can be changed beautifully because the law of existence is so organized that this can be occurred, it can, can occur. There is no need at any time for violence or frustration or the individual to get angry at himself or curse heaven because things do not go well. Actually, they do not go well because the individual has no acceptance of the importance of affections and sympathies in living. I know we uh, find in art a good deal of thought of this nature. The great artists of the past they were mostly self-trained, had a little knowledge maybe of the palette from some predecessor, but for the most part the, the beautiful things that we see came directly from themselves or they came through themselves, probably, would be a little more honorable way of describing it. Raphael, his magnificent paintings, flowed through himself. And every human being is a potential Raphael. We think of scientists and philosophers and skilled people in all fields, and we uh, think that they are all individuals. Every skill in the world is a manifestation of the one divine skill that is at the source of existence. All skill, all beauty, all truth, all hope, all love, all these together come from one source. And each is an expression. Each is like a priest in a house, a part of a great religious unity, each with a special labor, each with a special service to render each one capable of doing a particular thing. 
and Kipling in one of his poems says, and each on his separate star, painting the thing as he sees it, for the God of things as they are. And this is another thing we all have to learn, that we are not always to judge people as to whether they agree with us or not, or whether we agree with them, or whether their arts are of any interest to us, or whether their scientists, sciences touch us. These are not important. All forms of knowledge ultimately contribute to the perfection of man, but they also contribute to man's infinite relationship with deity. Therefore, everything that is worthwhile, everything that is good, is part of a tremendous pageantry of dedications. I wish we could find some way to inspire people to have an experience of simple affection. It probably is still obtainable to most people in one way or another. Something in which love comes out from you without hope of reward. Something that makes you feel a kinship with life a recognition of proximity to something greater than yourself, something that you meet with sympathy only and not with criticism, something you do not estimate intellectually and find wanting, just simple experience of a devotion or the exhilaration of a simple ex uh, acceptance of nature's joys, nature's beauties, nature's wonders. Sit down sometime, perhaps, in a garden, and just look a, few, look a few flowers, and look a few flowers. Or go out by the side of a river and watch the waters and the trees. Do what the Chinese do. Simply relax into a mood of a beautiful world. If enough people do this, it will have a great effect. As asymmetry and discord and dissonance do damage. And this is one of the problems of our entertainment field today, which has lost all sense of the joy of beauty, or the oneness of the divine plan of things. But it's possible for the person to find in something simple, something in not maybe more than a sunrise, or a kindly word from a friend, or a smile from a child, something that simply makes the heart move makes you kind of glad inside and causes you to smile back, causes you to have the same feeling, in a spontaneous exchange of goodness. So these types of moods became, can become a meditational process with people if they wanted to. They can become uh, part of a daily experience of never seeing things, but seeing into things. Never judging from surfaces, but searching for substances and depths. And in problems of relationship, never coming to a hasty judgment. Trying to understand other people, rather than to be willing to go on misunderstanding them forever. Some kind of an experience in which love of that which is better comes through each of us is so much better than the kind of affection that we use when we say, uh, I just loved lunch. This is uh, <laughs> uh, the wrong approach to lunch. It is probable that lunch might be likable, but the word love is reserved for something that is a deep universal reality, something that deserves real attention, real consecration. The power to love is in everything. Sometimes it is killed by an incident. Sometimes it is destroyed by a moment. Sometimes it takes years to recover from a disillusionment. But in all of these things, the person should look inside of himself. If he is dragging along with him uh, attitudes that, and feelings that are not affectionate, that are not kindly, that are not charitable, he should do something about that. Or if he has been deficient in the con non quality, compassion. Compassion for the weak. Compassion for the helpless. Compassion for those younger forms of life that are growing up in the midst of our difficult days. Compassion for everything that is good. 
and a great willingness to sacrifice something of the immediate pleasure for an ultimate joy arising from the things that we do that are right. So we can work with these problems a little bit and gradually discover what we should have learned from other lessons. Suppose we have had a bad experience, a badly broken home, or some very difficult pattern in life, and we have never forgotten it and has never ceased to hurt us. That is an incident right there which is a tremendous opportunity. Let us try to study the situation more carefully than we normally do. If the disaster hit, to what degree were each of those involved involved in the disaster? What did we all do that was wrong? Why did we not do this or that? And most of all, was this disaster the result of the failure of love? Was there ulterior motive in the love as we thought we expressed it? Did we marry for security and not for love? Uh, did we marry for passing pleasures and happiness and not for the great serious relationships of good? Did we uh, marry only outwardly, but never inwardly? Were we willing to drift along, each living his own life, cherishing freedom above all other things? In, uh, in the Eastern philosophies, there is no freedom except in love. There is no freedom from love. That, what, that which uh, we try to escape in thinking that we are running away from love cannot be that. It must be something else. Because love does not hurt. And if it is sincere, there are always solutions. And if there is no other solution, there is always the possibility of a different degree of love, which we call friendship. And things that are not compatible can remain friends forever. If each in its own turn gives the other the right to convictions that are natural and reasonable. All the way along, and we have health problems also that cause us to be a little doubtful about the value of providence. Yet all these problems have to be faced. And life, is in some mysterious way, does pay us constructively for the things that we do well. In all the emergencies of life, if we've done our best, there seems to be a great probability that heaven will be kind. The trouble that we mostly have is that we leave this world with too much unfinished business. Business that we can't finish here and was of no value to us anywhere else. We, have, we leave here without actually learning to love the world or the life within ourselves or those around us or the great beauties of nature. We just go smaller and smaller until finally we drop out, mostly centered upon ourselves. The individual so centered is, is missing everything. If we love ourselves, we will do those things which make the self good. If we love ourselves, we will be lovable people to all others. And where we try to simply develop an emotional satisfaction out of things that have no value, then we will have to face the consequences that these uh, emotions are disturbed, betrayed, or injured. Uh, wrong emotions have to be corrected. And every ulterior motive in emotional living is a mistake and must be paid for. Every time in which we use anything wrong, if we do not obey the divine plan of things in all that we do, there's going to be trouble. Whereas if we try to grow sincerely every day, we will find that most of the antagonisms and, and, and animosities that we have feared will fade away and not bother us anymore. So to love is a, is a healing thing. Most of the miseries of the soul are due to the fact we have not learned to love. That we have learned to hope that somebody is going to love us. But we have not yet been able to forget 
the selfish side of our natures long enough to cooperate with those in need or those who we can serve and help. An example, of course, like Dr. Schweitzer, is a good case at point. He had the uh, common problem of usefulness. He became a medical missionary. In other words, he served God or by serving the natives of Gabon in Africa. He gave his life as a religious act, a dedication to the service of those who need. Love is also always dedication. It is dedication to something greater than we are. It is dedication to God through some necessity of man, something that man can do to help God. Not because God in the last analysis needs help, because deity is all sufficient, but we can help God by helping man to find God. And we do this by making people say of him, he was a good man. He served others. He was helpful. He gave a life of dedication. The world honors him, but not enough people follow his example. And it is the following of the example that makes all things come true. So if you love, become skillful enough to serve intelligently those that you do love. If you love God, serve God in a gentle, kindly way, without frustrations or inhibitions, and without hope of reward. The final reward for love is to be loved. And this is something that very few people really earn the right to. Therefore, they think they are loved and then they're betrayed. They think they have found a friend, but the friend fades out. And all of these failures are simply due to the lack of a level of integrity. To go back to the Neoplatonists that we started out with, it is to be remembered that they made a classification, a ladder of affections, showing each rung of the ladder and how the individual climbs from the most primitive isolation to utter unity. And as the world in the same way must climb from nationalism to internationalism, must rise from racialism to interracialism, and rise from all kinds of religions to the one final faith, faith based upon the love of God and the service of each other. If we can get these points a little bit more firmly in our hearts and minds, I think in time uh, we'll all be a lot happier and uh, things in the world will go better. Oh, thank you very much.